Brian, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to welcome one of the really big guns from European cardiology here to the BHS meeting in Edinburgh, Professor Michael Bohm from Homburg at the uh, University of Saarland. Michael, it's great to welcome you here to uh, talk to us about renal denervation and tales from Europe. Now, Michael has a glittering uh, CV, which I'll only just talk a little bit about, but um, I think it culminated with the Order of Merit from the uh, Federal Republic of Germany two years ago. Michael was president of the, British, of the uh, German Cardiac Society and was chairman of the ESC Program Committee. And those of you who have been to the ESC with uh, 32,000 delegates can imagine how major a program that is. But Michael, I mean, although heart failure is one of your big interests, you have done in your own lab 500 renal denervation procedures, I think, um, that you were telling me yesterday. And so really it's this area that's so tempting to uh, look at intervention that you're going to tell us about today. So Professor Michael Bohm, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Edinburgh, to the uh, British Hypertension Society, and Tales from Europe. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I thank you for the invitation to Edinburgh. So um, you see this title, which is a little bit challenging to stories from Europe, whatever that means. But I will do three things. First, I will tell you what has been done and what is the background. Then we have the HTN3 study, which is called a pivotal study, which was shem controlled But now we have a number of sub-analyses putting it into a different light. And then the final point will be what can we do and what should be the design of an upcoming trial to definitely show whether it's working or not, because this apparently is still an open question. So these are my disclosures. Um, you can see that sympathetic activation takes place in many cardiovascular diseases, like in hypertension. Uh, on uncomplicated hypertension, then there is evidence that in those patients who have end organ damage like renal disease and in particular heart failure, there is an even more sharp increase in sympathetic activation, which has been associated to outcomes in these patients when the circulating norepinephrine content or the spillover from the kidneys or from the heart is taken. So what we are talking about is just the beginning here of the story in hypertension and resistant hypertension. And there are many studies planned outside the field of hypertension to show whether a reduction of sympathetic activity uh, independent from blood pressure makes sense. So this is an open field still. And the background is that, of course, here, as you can see here, sympathetic overdrive is related to end organ damage in the kidney and in the heart, but also in uh, the pancreas because uh, sympathetic activation is associated with diabetes type 2 and, of course, with blood pressure. And all these mechanisms might act in concert to produce end organ damage and ter uh, terminal organ failure. So the future will be also to have a study on cardiovascular outcomes. But first, it was started with hypertension, as you can see here. And I present to you the Simplicity Development Program, which is one of the programs in with one catheter, which was uh, planned uh, very a long time ago, and I think it's very complete. So I think this development program um, has some logic in it because there was a first immense study just showing whether blood pressure can be reduced under non-controlled condition without uh, any control group. Then there was a randomized trial without a sham control, which was uh, uh, comparing the, inter the intervention against regular medical treatment. And then everybody uh, was waiting for the HTN3 trial, which was driven by the FDA to get the approval of the devices in the United States. And this was a sham control trial. And when this was planned and started, uh, we designed uh, together with Professor Brian Williams, uh, the global uh, the registry to show whether this also works in uh, real life. Scenarios where the investigators are not proctored and the procedures are performed outside of uh, well-defined and well-trained centers. So. Um, this is a first immense study. I do not show you the primary data. We have here uh, last year uh, the publication in The Lancet showing that uh, the, uh, the beyond the normal uh, observation time, which was six months here, there is no sign of re innervation of the kidneys. There is a sustained reduction of blood pressure holding <clears throat> to 36 months. And these are the data in those patients where indeed the full data sets were available. So the next step was the Simplicity HTN2 study, which was designed to 
uh, randomize patients either immediately to the uh, renal denervation procedure or hold them on regular treatment, uh, but these patients were uh, uh, indeed treated openly without control group and out sham group. And you can see that uh, there is no effect in the control group here, but there is a strong effect in those patients who underwent immediately the procedure, and there is a long-term follow-up of, uh, of 24 months now showing the similar effects here. However, it was argued that this is confounded by the Hofthorn effect, so patients might, when they have been on the table in the care lab might recognize that it gets serious and here they start taking their drugs and due to these different adherence to medication or other lifestyle behaviors um, um, associated with a better uh, uh, with a better health there might be these blood pressure reductions which does not take place on the other side however this effect could also be the reverse that those patients who have had the procedure do not take their drugs because they might think that the blood pressure problem is fixed so these are the open question and then Simplicity HTN3 was uh, eagerly evaded and was presented this year at the American College of Cardiology. So the primary question was whether the procedure is safe, whether there are uh, procedural complications which are below a 9.8% margin because this was set by the FTBA to be acceptable. And what you can see, the complications related to the procedures were only 1.4% percent indicating that indeed with a large level of confidence that the procedure uh, is self is, is safe however these were the primary the co-primary efficacy endpoint and you can see indeed that looks not very good you can see renal denervation in trend but has a clearly non-significant different blood pressure reduction compared to the control group. And you can see here the baseline blood pressure values which are well balanced because a reduction after renal denervation is strongly dependent on the blood pressure at baseline. And you can see that these changes are significant but also significant in the control group without any difference between the two, uh, between the two groups. And again, in order to show that uh, maybe there is less a placebo effect or dependence on ABPM, you can see the same results on ABPM in the denervation group and the control group. There is a significant reduction, but this was quite similar in the sham operated group compared to the control group with no significance. So what about the following analyses? So this was a quite complicated trial. Patients were blinded, and there were some subgroups who might have been relevant. You can see here that uh, in this cohort, uh, there were uh, non-African Americans and African Americans treated. This was a predefined subgroups, and this amounts to about a little bit more than 20% of the patients, which is reflecting the demography of the United States. And you can see that in those patients who are non-African American descent, you can see that there is a significant difference in this subgroup. While African Americans had a very strong placebo effect, which was in trend even more pronounced uh, than the blood pressure reduction in the treated group here. So the first impression was there could be a difference uh, between the response to, of the uh, bl uh, black Americans due to the fact that they respond differently, like an all head where they have a smaller response to ACE inhibitors. However, you can see that this difference in results is not related to the response to the denervation. It is more related to a, a huge effect, a more pronounced effect in the sham group where medications, of course, were changed before they entered the trial. So this is here uh, the blood pressure changes in patients on vasodilators. In particular, the Afro-Americans had a very high load on vasodilators. This is submitted. This is a secondary analysis uh, 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 presented at the hotline at the uh, EuroPCR in Paris. Again, you can see here the change in office blood pressure, which was in non-Americans, not on vasodilators, was, was, was in trend there, but of course underpowered, not significant. And you can see here that patients on vasodilators had a huge had a huge uh, reduction in the uh, in the in the sham arm uh, and here you can see that apparently it could have been something to do with the use of the vasodilators 
So what about the procedural aspect? And this is another interesting thing. Um, in Germany, we were heavily criticized because we were able to do a huge number of interventions. This, uh, uh, this is, of course, nice in our center because every patient was in a study, in a trial, in an observational investigation. Uh, and so we had a lot of experience. However, in Germany, we have a quite a great liberty to use it early, so it was used several thousand times in the population. Um, in America, therefore, we cannot blame the American colleagues for this trial. The experience was very low. And what you can see here, the number of procedures per investigator in Simplicity HTN3, and here the number of operators. And you can see that more than 60% of the investigators have only done one or two interventions. This would be something where you never uh, design a coronary study, something like this, and you can see it levels out here to very low numbers. So 60% one or two interventions. The other thing is that this was primarily a safety study and the investigators were proctored by proctors who were proctored in centers in Germany. And you can see that what happens to a denervated artery, as shown here, you can see these little spots here, which we call denervation, uh, denervation spots. Um, this is a subendothelial edema, which is a reflection that you have touched and heated the vessel. And usually you can see and count the notches, and this was nicely done, and you can find these data in the supplement of the original paper of HTN3. You can see that in 60%, one or zero notches were detected. In the registry we have done now in Europe, you find five to six notches per renal artery. So the treatment intensity here is another open question in simplicity, HTN3. And again, the investigators now are going more in depth to their data. And this again was presented at EuroPCR by Dr. Kansari from the United States. And you can see the ablation attempts which does not mean that they were full ablations, but these were at least where the denervation was started in different spots of the artery with a unipolar uh, catheter. And what you can see that indeed, approximately at the threshold of greater than 12, meaning about six attempts per site, there is a huge increase of the efficacy or of the blood pressure drop in the, in the arms, uh, in the treatment arm. And you can see that also the difference to the sham gets greater. So there is indirect evidence, although no proof, that patients might be undertreated. And when you then look at the ABPM response, which apparently or might be less confounded, you can see the same trend. From 12 onwards, the difference to the shams gets bigger and the effect is larger. So what is the effect? Are these effects additive? Indeed, this is norepinephrine concentrations related to the ablating catheter. This is a study by Felix Mafut from our group. And you can see, depending on the number of ablations, there is a drop of, uh, uh, of norepinephrine. And here you can see the uh, affected nerves on histology. This is a PIC study. And therefore, the treatment is very important, the intensity of treatment. The other thing is, it is a question where you denervate. Um, the goal is, although with the unipolar catheter, it's not uh, always easy to find a full, uh, a full circumferential denervation here. So you can have to do it inferior, anterior, superior, and posterior to have a circumferential denervation. And indeed, uh, uh, this was also presented. You can see office blood pressure, ambulatory and home blood pressure, depending on the circum circumferentiality of denervation techniques. No one or indeed on both sides for quadrant ablation. And you can see the blood pressure drop on office ABPM and home blood pressure measurements is more pronounced, the better you get the whole circumference of the artery. And therefore the question is for the next step is whether we can use better devices. And this is the old, this is the old device, which is a little bit floppy here and you do it by eyeballing to find the circ full circumferential area of the artery. And these catheters with the balloon, with a spiral catheter, with a basket or with ultrasound are available now to potentially improve the ability to do a complete circumferential denervation. The other thing is, where should we denervate? When we started, everybody says, okay, we have to do proximal cranial because all the nerves have to go back to the brain, the efferent nerves, which are supposed to be important. And this was done here now in pigs. And this is from an editorial on the paper of Renduvelmani, which uh, definitely looked at the location of renal arteries. 
And you can see here uh, uh, the inferior and circumferential one, proximal and distal. And it is true that there are more renal arteries proximal, but however, there are more far away from the renal artery. And you can see here in the distal part of the vessels, they are more in close vicinity to the renal artery. And when you then do the denervation, you can see that you here hit about 40% of the nerves, and here you hit about 60 to 80 percent of the nerves, depending where you are. So circumferentiality, doing it distally, even going to branches, might be the next way to do it. And it is less predictable, because when you have, for instance, a little lymph vessel very close to the artery, it produces something like a shadow for the energy. And therefore, you might miss a distal denervation. And the next step would be, and the message is, to do it in multi-sites, doing circumferentiality and as much as you can. Because when there are small veins, nerves, or other nerves, like, like, like pain nerves, it might be difficult. What about medical treatment? Uh, the patients were run in in uh, two weeks. They were rescreened, and medical treatment was intensified two weeks before randomization. And indeed, uh, there are about 20 to 30 percent of the patients where treatment uh, was changed. It was changed in 40 percent of the patients enrolled in Simplicity HDN3, although all patients were supposed to stay on treatment. So you might call this a protocol violation. But now, what happens in the SHEM group? And you can see this is from two weeks ago, where there was a, 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 a hotline presentation at the ESC, six months, 12 months, uh, diastolic, systolic blood pressure. And then those patients who crossed over had done the procedure, um, uh, have been in the SHEM group before, and have the procedure redone. So the first question is, what happens between six and 12 months on renal denervation? You can see there is a further 3.3 millimeter reduction in office blood pressure in those treated immediately. And you can compare here a procedure done under SHEM condo uh, conditions and openly. And you can see that the blood pressure response is very similar whether the procedure is done blindly or whether it is done under open conditions. So apparently Hofthorn effect is less taken place in the uh, uh, intervention group. However, uh, what happens to those crossing over? And uh, cro the, here you can see uh, the same trend, yeah, pronounced effect. Uh, in the in the in the sham group here in the in the treated group on ABPM, but what happens in the sham group here? You have the non-crossovers at six months and non-crossovers at 12 months. The blood pressure, this is systolic, goes up again when patients are coming out of the trial. So when the pressure of the trial is relieved, you can see that the blood pressure increase, unlike in the intervention group where there was a further drop, was increased by 11.5 millimeters of mercury systolic and 5 millimeters of mercury diastolic. And the same holds true on ABPM. So apparently, Hofthorn effects, adherence problems are taking place, not so much in the treated group rather than in the control group. So therefore, we uh, set out, and this is just for the comparison, because we thought, of course, simplicity HTN3 would be positive, what happens in the real world. So this registry was done in the real world, and you can see here it was a global event. And you can see that in the HTN3 cohort, the blood pressure reduction, which is the same inclusion criteria, we have 1,500 patients now, 245 fulfilled these criteria of HTN3. Blood pressure reduction was larger. Here is the placebo group. And you can see this was before the registry started the procedural experience. More than 60% had more done more than 15 procedures. It is exactly the reverse as was observed in the uh, simplicity HTN3 trial. So what are the guidelines saying? And there is a position paper from the e uh, ESH that indeed in centers where there is experience and there should be centers of excellence according to the European Society of Hypertension Classification, it can be done in the hands of experienced investigators. However, the most important thing is what we have learned. Um, subgroups, uh, we should uh, look 
whether vasodilator use is a predictor of non-response. We have data and evidence, which is not published yet, that those with isolated hypertension uh, respond less. So once the arteries are stiff, renal denervation is left less effective. The, there is ongoing analysis in the Afro-American subgroups and patients with high blood pressure and not low blood pressure, as we have seen in the registry, uh, benefit from the procedure. Patients with 140 to 160 has a very low blood pressure response. There are procedural aspects. More intensely, denervation is something, uh, is something important. We have to go to the periphery, so the anatomy is important. Novel devices should be used, and there should be a training period before investigators enter the trial. And there should be stability of treatment, no drops in and out, and we should evaluate whether changes in drug combinations have taken place, and this was not captured in uh, the Simplicity HKN3 trial. With this, thank you very much for your attention. Michael, thank you for a really great talk. I'm sure there are questions. There are well people are thinking about questions. I mean, we in Glasgow, we didn't have the experience that you had in Homburg, but we had the most in the UK, and procedural back pain seemed very important. I talked to people at the Mayo Clinic who were doing the ablations, and the merest suggestion of back pain, and they were told to stop. Now, in Glasgow, we just kept going in more and more pain, and we had some spectacular results from this procedure, as you must have seen as well. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that procedurally, how renal denervation is carried out must be the central explanation. Is that your belief as well? Yeah, we give drugs when there is pain, usually. <laughs> <laughs> we rarely do that. We do, we do but, uh, no, no, but, but you're, Arjen, you're completely right. So if there is no pain at all, or if you, the pain level is quite low, you do not feel very comfortable. And the reason is that the sympathetic nerves directly run in parallel to pain C fibers. Yeah? So therefore, uh, there is a relationship uh, of efficacy to pain and uh, and pain and effectiveness. However, that these pain that you give so many drugs during the procedure does not make it easy to judge intraprocedurally the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the success. It's not possible so far. Okay. Questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, it's nice to see blood pressure dropping by 10 to 15 millimeter of mercury systolic six months, nine months after the procedure. But as a practicing physician, my main interest is what proportion of my patients have blood pressure below 140 over 90 and what proportion have significantly managed to reduce their drug overload. And this is the credibility gap. Unless we make progress in these two criteria, there will always be a question mark. Yeah. The point is that these patients in the trials is a special population. They were on 5.8 drugs already, so they have a very high intensity load of the patient. So of course, we can only uh, think that maybe the, everything has been done by the investigators to improve the combination of the therapy. But 50 millimeters drop is not so bad, taking these non-controlled or even resistant condition into consideration. Tom. So the joint British guidelines, Michael, um, we, after Simplicity 3, issued a statement that said we shouldn't do any more renal denervation out with the context of a trial. Do you think we were right? I think you were right. Uh, the problem is what should a trial like? As I, I, to, I said we, are very, we have been very liberal when a device is coming on the market in Germany. What happens now, the insurance companies completely stopped reimbursement. Uh, that is the reason, because they do, not, they do not dive into the trial whether it's good or whether it's done. So they are thinking of paying for patients being in a controlled trial. But now the insurance companies think what should be the quality of a trial, and this uh, is obviously a little bit problematic. Okay, Philip Bath and Gordon McInnes. I wonder if you could uh, discuss with us the sham procedure. And the reason I ask is that with another device, um, we've had a problem in a trial where the sham itself may well have led to treatment. Now, the, as I understand it, the sham people had angiography and presumably that involved putting a catheter into the renal artery. Is there any way that that could itself have led to some form of treatment effect and therefore the absence of difference between the two groups? 
I'm not sure. I mean, they, what they have done, they have blinded them. They have blinded them. They have given, given them the uh, complete anesthesia, comparable in the other groups. They made a check whether they were blinded or not. Because there were rumors these patients might not have been completely blinded, but they have taken every effort to do it. And now I think the point of your question is, does renal, uh, uh, renal angiography is doing something? I don't know. I don't think so, to be honest. Because we do, and we also, uh, cardiologists do it uh, quite frequently, just when they pass by the renals. We do it also when a patient is on more than three drugs, or have had unclear pulmonary edema, or have an increase of ACE inhibitor with creatinine. So then we do it, and I, my feeling is we never looked at that uh, systematically, that there is no effect of angiography. But it's an interesting point. Uh, last question, Gordon McInnes. Michael, I enjoyed your presentation. But you sounded to me rather like Alex Salmon explaining how he won the referendum despite only getting 44.7% <laughs> of the vote. I mean, no end of data dredging is going to alter the conclusion that this was a negative trial and that this procedure as it is applied does not work. The other problem with this trial is it was clearly done without any consideration of good clinical or good research practice. And I wonder whether or not you agree with me that the authors of this study should probably be going to jail uh, <laughs> rather than trying to promote this worthless procedure. Um. <laughs> uh, thank you, Gordon, for that question. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Yet yeah, going to jail is something if you do it intentionally, but they were just not trained to do it. So I wouldn't blame the investigators. And I simply, there are so many tra uh, 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 trials which uh, failed, and I think we should give another chance to the procedure and do a better one. And therefore, they have provided a lot of information and initiated a lot of research concerning the uh, anatomy because everybody was thinking it is clear, but it is definitely not. And to improve, to improve the procedure, to select patients who benefit and who do not benefit, and then go ahead with other maybe indications like atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Okay. Alice Stanton, last yeah. question. It's noteworthy that it, uh, it didn't look as if it did as well in the blacks. Uh, they are regarded as having a less active renin angiotensin system. My memory of Simplicity 3 is that it also tended not to do so well in the older patients and in the diabetic patients. And uh, I wonder if we should be looking at patients with activated renin angiotensin system. And I also wonder whether we're looking at the more severe burnt out hypertensives who don't have an autonomic, a functioning autonomic nervous system, and whether there's any thoughts of going into a less late stage hypertension. Yeah. Oh. The point is that uh, we have now Simplicity HN3 and the registry, and it turned out that the predictors of non response is vasodilator use and isolated systolic hypertension. That could point to the fact that indeed stiff arteries and much advanced hypertension, because they have a really severe, most severe hypertensive patients, might not benefit as much. There is no signal also in our patients, which were 400, that diabetes is, is a signal. Even when you have patients with impaired glucose tolerance, without full-blown diabetes, you can improve diabetes. Yeah? So there is no signal. In the aged population, there is indeed a small interaction pointing toward a little less effect, a smaller effect, uh, and this could be the case. Unfortunately, we do not have a direct measure uh, of the activity of the renal angiotensin system. There is no relationship to, blood pre uh, to heart rate at baseline, uh, which might be an outreach for sympathetic activation. There is no association. And um, so I think it is a little bit open still, yeah? Michael, thank you very much. It was an excellent talk, and uh, you. you can see there's been lots of interest in it.